everyone. Thanks for making the long trek up all the way up those four flights of stairs to make it. Um, I equate bright colors with fun, and so this will hopefully be the most exciting and fun uh, introduction to Apache Kafka. And then there's Lego also. Who doesn't love Lego? I mean, that's why you're here, right? You're not here for the Kafka, you're here for the Lego. So anyway, um, yeah, so Kafka's a very <laughs> dense system, and so I wanted to make it as light and, and hopefully as interesting as possible, so that is why it's Lego-themed, and we'll see how deeply deep I can get into that. All right, so before we go into what Kafka is and exploring all the components of it, I, I like to motivate people because I learn better if I actually understand why I should be caring about this technology. So why Kafka? Well, there's a million reasons, I think so, and I'm not just saying that because I'm <laughs> advocating for this technology every day. Um, but over the last uh, you know, many years, we have been undergoing a paradigm shift right? in how we deal with our data, how we process it, how we store it, how we move it. Um, and so we're moving from slower batch-focused systems to real-time systems. Okay? And Apache Kafka is one of the technologies at the heart of that. Okay? Um, so uh, Kafka and st uh, enables stream processing, allows you to make a more uh, event-driven, reactive system. Um, but again, it's just one of the technologies that allow you to move from that batch-focused way, uh, way of life to this real-time way of life where you can process things event by event. But the reason that I think Kafka is one of the best technologies for this is its flexibility, right? Not only are you able to process event by event, you can have any number of applications reading from the stream, same streams of events and doing completely different things in completely decoupled ways, all right? Um, so if you like, you can still get sort of a batch-focused processing on top of those real-time event streams, um, but still have uh, you know, the best of both worlds and do the real-time processing as well. OK, so Kafka's great. That's your 30-second introduction to why you should care about it. Now let's get into the actual reason you're here, OK? Kafka is a distributed event streaming platform. OK, we're going to get into all of those terms at some point throughout the next 40 minutes. Um, but before we get into the components of Kafka, I know I keep putting it off, I keep putting it off. Uh, there's one thing you really, really, really need to understand. And if this is the only thing you take away from this presentation today, I'm happy, OK? <laughs> to use Kafka successfully, you need to understand events. You need to know how to think in events and start modeling in events. And that might, ask, might sound like a pretty big ask. Hey, rewire the way you think about systems. But it's not, OK? I promise. Because as humans, as programmers, as users, you already know what events are. You know how to process with them, OK? What are events? Well, an event could be adding anything to an online cart. Yeah? Uh, the location and velocity of some ship on the open sea. Or the act of placing a pizza order. OK, those are all events. So what is an event actually? Well, it's a thing that has happened. Wow, profound, right? A thing that has occurred, OK? So what do you need to know to know that something has occurred? Well, when that thing happened would be a good place to start, OK? This thing happened now, or 10 minutes ago, or 40 years ago, it doesn't matter, OK? You need to know who or what was involved, and then any supporting information to sort of flesh out that thing that just occurred. It's pretty simple, right? That's an event. Um, so events are at the heart of Kafka. Um, you'll also see events described as being a combination of notification and state, right? Notification, ha, this thing occurred right now, and here's the information you need to actually make sense of that thing that occurred right now. Think of it as every time you get a text on your phone, right? That's, that's an event. Notification, here's the bulk of what you need to react to, yeah? So regardless of what your um, event is, another really important part of them is that they're meant to be immutable. And that's a big hurdle for a lot of folks, OK? Um, remember, events describe things that have already happened in the past. They have occurred. We can't change that, OK? You placed that pizza order, right? You added that thing to your cart. It doesn't matter what you want to do with it in the future. You did that thing then, OK? We know you did that. We have a record of it, OK? So events just aren't meant to be changed. Does that mean that you can't build systems that can undo things or you know, go back? No, we still have that flexibility, right? Just because I added something to my cart doesn't mean that I can't change that quantity or remove that thing from the cart later on. Just because a ship has moved, it's changed its location doesn't mean that it can't go back to a location at a previous time. Just because we mistakenly called and ordered 143 pizzas doesn't mean we can't call and change that, and hopefully they'll respect that change. Um, so we can go and change these things. But changing or undoing events really just means you're adding another event. 
to describe that, you know, the new state of that thing, right? The act of removing something from your cart is an event. Going back to a location, also an event. And calling and updating a pizza order, that's also an event, okay? And as you're doing this, as you're adding more and more events, in most cases, the old events are still pretty relevant to know, okay? So over time, as we are uh, generating events for a given entity ID, for a given uh, cart ID, a, a vessel ID, or an order number, we're going to keep track of those events, OK? Because they're all relevant. And then as new events flow in, over time, we're going to add these to a stream of immutable events that describe that entity over time. So we've got this nice little timeline that describe these things, OK? So events are important. You can leave now if you, if you don't care about Kafka. Um, but events are really, really important, and they're going to shape how we work with Kafka. And that's pretty much the data that we're going to be working with. All right? As we go through the rest of this talk, and as you work with Kafka out in the wild, you're going to hear two things quite often. You're going to hear messages. You're going to hear records. Okay? Um, the data that we wish to write to Kafka should represent an event, right? a thing that has occurred. We're good. We all understand that. Uh, to get that data into Kafka, we are going to use a producing client to send a message containing a record with that event in it. Okay? So you're going to hear record and, and message used synonymously or interchangeably throughout this talk. I'm sorry. Hopefully it doesn't. I'm level setting with you all. I hope it doesn't confuse you. Okay? It's pretty much the same thing. Cool. All right. Now that we know what events are and what our goal is to write these things into Kafka, now we can start to think about how we're storing these into Kafka because they have to go somewhere, right? Um, the primary unit of storage in Kafka is called a Kafka topic, and topics typically represent just an individual data set containing these events. All right? As uh, we write these events into Kafka, these events are going to be written in order. Okay? As we write, uh, continue writing more and more events, every new event is just going to be appended to the end of that topic. You'll also notice that each of these events, as I'm writing them in, they have a monotonically increasing number associated with it. This is called an offset. Offsets are really important to help us uniquely identify that particular event's position in this topic. All right? And they're really useful for consuming applications to know where they are in reading this data later on. Okay. So far, as we're adding all these events in here, this might look and feel familiar, like another data structure we're aware of, like a queue. Stop it. No queues. Okay? Kafka topic is not a queue. Right? You can get queuing functionality out of a Kafka topic if you'd like to. Um, but no, a Kafka topic is not a queue. Fundamentally, it is a completely different data structure. It is a log. Okay? Um, so when events are consumed from a Kafka topic, the default functionality is, all right, it is there. The events are in that Kafka topic for some configurable amount of time. And consuming that data does not affect it being in that topic. Okay, so we're not you know, popping things off of a queue and consuming it. No, it is staying in that log file for us to use for some configurable amount of time. Okay? Um, another thing to keep in mind with our Kafka topics is that these topics are also immutable. Got a lot of immutability for such a flexible and real-time system, right? Um, but once the data is written to that Kafka topic in that order, we are not going to go in and remove any data from the middle, generally. Um, it's durable and long living, right? So if event number three there is that erroneous pizza order that, oh my goodness, I don't want to pay for 143 pizzas, that's unfortunate. Well, cool. We can add another event. Uh, that's our update pizza order event. And I'm not going to go in and remove event number three. Sorry, I did originally place that pizza order with a really stupid order. Um, but the update is just going to be appended to the end of that topic. All right. Um, so to summarize, um, the primary unit of storage in Kafka is that Kafka topic. It is a durable, immutable, append-only log um, that we can continue to add data to for as long as we wish. Um, and that data is going to live in that topic for some configurable retention period. Okay. Now, we don't actually stop at the topic level. Uh, topics are broken down into smaller components called partitions. And so here we have a Kafka topic configured to have three partitions. And typically, the data is split up across these partitions based on the key of the data. So in this case, we could say that the key um, was just the color of the brick, as you can imagine. Um, this isn't always the case, though, basing, uh, splitting it up by key. There are a number of different partitioning strategies that you can employ. Um, you can just evenly distribute the data and not care about the key. Um, you have a lot of flexibility there. But everything you just learned about the topics at the topic level will also pretty much apply to the partition level as well. Um, so new data is going to be appended to the end of the partition. 
Each record or event is going to be assigned an offset that uniquely identifies its place within that specific partition. So you'll see the off offset numbers repeat across the partitions, um, but we really only care about the ordering of the data within that partition. And that's some good news there, is that if you're writing data with the same key to the same partition, you're going to ensure the ordering of those events. Okay? Um, so if you care about guaranteeing order, uh, you can get that within, within the partition level. Okay? And the partitions are also backed by the durable append-only log. Um, so any side-based uh, retention limits are going to apply at that individual partition level. Okay? So now that you know that data is, where data is stored in Kafka, you know, in those topics and more specifically in those partitions, you could go about your life working with Kafka and not really think about anything more deep than that. That's completely fine. Um, but there are some important things to know about partitioning that affect functionality later on, so I want to bring them up. And first and foremost, uh, Kafka is a distributed system. So, you know, as far as like why we're bothering to use our partitions, partitions are how we distribute that data across the nodes in our Kafka cluster and ultimately affect how our cluster and our applications will scale later on. So, generally speaking, the more partitions you have, um, the more you could horizontally scale out your consuming applications later on. But you don't want to go too far. You know, too much of a good thing can be an absolutely awful thing. So, uh, too many partitions can be just as bad as too few as far as how we uh, scale our applications down the road. Um, there are entire talks and blogs on how to choose the optimal number of partitions for your Kafka topic. So, if you are curious, I will direct you toward those. Um, all right, so how are these partitions, now that we are on board with actually storing the data across these partitions, how are they distributed across the cluster? Great question. Um, so the nodes of a Kafka cluster are called brokers. These brokers can be running, use your imagination, they can be running wherever you want. Um, bare metal, VMs, containers in the cloud, doesn't matter, I don't care, just run your brokers somewhere. Okay. So here is a very simple, very toy cluster, Lego toy. Um, here's a simple cluster where we have three nodes uh, with three topics with some number of partitions. Um, results may vary, but your partitions might be distributed like this in this case. They might not, but they might be this way. Right? Um, why put the partitions on different nodes? Well, the biggest reason is when it comes to, uh, like I said, consuming that data later on um, so that um, the, the level of the number of partitions that we have is going to cap our the level of parallelism that we have for consuming applications. And so in this case, if we have, say, for topic B, our orange topic, um, we have our three partitions distributed across those three brokers evenly. So if we have our capped parallelism for a consuming application, which is having three consumers read from that information, um, we're not inundating any one broker with the request to consume all that data, right? We're able to spread that load across those brokers um, and not impact uh, other applications that are also trying to write to those brokers at the same time. So it's all about um, spreading the load across the cluster. Right. So this is great. Um, as you can see here, the partitions for each topic are distributed pretty evenly. Yeah? The goal here is to not have any one broker have too many partitions from the same topic on it, and also to distribute all of the cluster-wide partitions across the cluster to the best we can. And Kafka is going to do that for you. Right? So this is pretty optimal, awesome, but what happens when the inevitable hits and the intern trips over the wire in some data center and suddenly we've lost the machine? Well, this is unfortunate. Um, this is not ideal. We've lost some data. Um, the good news is we've only lost a third of the data. Yeah, so I, I don't know if that makes anyone happy. Um, but the good news is, yeah, we've only lost one machine. Cool. Um, the other two thirds of the data is, is, is great. It's safe on the other machines. Um, but that's, that's not good enough. Kafka's going to take it a step further with something called replication. Uh, replication is a configurable parameter that determines uh, partition by partition how many copies of each partition exist across the cluster. Okay? So we're going to solve this situation by enabling replication. So here we have, again, a three-node cluster. Um, but we're going to look at it from the perspective of a single topic with three partitions. And we've also enabled a replication factor of three. Okay. So with replication enabled, we have two types of partitions. We have leader partitions and we have follower replicas. Okay. So you'll see here, um, so for partition zero that lives on broker zero in that darker color up there, when we are writing data to partition zero, we're first going to connect to broker zero and write that data onto that broker. Then synchronously, the cluster is going to copy that data over to the other follower replicas of that partition that exist not on broker zero, 
what exist on brokers one and two. Okay, that is by design. We don't want our backup copy to, to live on the same machine as our main copy. That would be absolutely silly. Um, and so you'll see that all of the partitions are split up in that way. Um, and again, Kafka is going to balance that for you when you have your replication enabled. All right. So this means that whenever broker zero goes down, ooh, that sucks. Um, we lost our main replica, our lead replica for partition zero. That's very unfortunate. But look, we still have two copies of it elsewhere on the other brokers. Okay? And so as soon as Kafka realizes that that broker is down, it's going to do a leader election process and realize that we have a full copy, an in-sync copy, on our other brokers, and it's going to elect one of those to be the new leader so that our, pro our producers and our consumers can keep functioning as expected. All right. So I know that felt like a little bit of an aside, but now you understand some of the nitty gritty of what happens and how these things are stored across the cluster. And also you can feel a little bit good, better about um, having your data stored um, in Kafka. OK, so now that we know how data is stored in Kafka and how we can start finally to understand what these, uh, the data, what these records actually look like that we're writing into Kafka. Um, it depends. Yeah, um, There's a few pieces of information that you absolutely need when you write data into Kafka and some optional fields as well. So, all you really need to know when you're writing data into Kafka is which topic are you trying to write to, and what is the event? What's the payload of that data, right? Optional fields, um, we could include the specific partition that you want to write to. So you can operate at that level of granularity, but do know that Kafka has uh, the, that have this functionality built into the producers so that they can actually select the partition um, based on their partitioning strategy. So if you want to ensure that the producers are always acting in the same way, um, that's a good way to ensure it. But you could override that if you want. Um, you can also include an overriding timestamp. If you don't include a timestamp with your message, it's just going to use the machine time. Um, you could include a key. This is really useful for partitioning in most cases, but um, you could also uh, ignore that. And there are some optional headers you can include as well. All right, so as an example, let's say that I'm on Lego, um, lego.com, I'm shopping, and I'm going to use their pick a brick feature. And so I have just added one blue one by one plate to my cart. What would that record look like? Great question. Well, I'm likely writing it to a topic that has to deal with cart updates, right? Let's, let's look at what users are doing, what they're adding and removing to their carts over time. And so very uh, uniquely, we're going to call this topic cart updates. And what is the actual event that we're writing into Kafka? Well, the event itself is that at some timestamp, I added one blue one by one plate to my cart, right? That's the event. It's not that much more complicated than that. Um, and so the value is exactly that. Maybe I also uh, enrich it a little bit more and have the specific cart ID that I'm adding it to. My cart, cart one, two, three, four. As far as the optional fields, well, I'm going to let the producer do what it knows how to do and uh, use the partitioning strategy that it has built in. So I'm not going to include an overriding timestamp or partition. Um, for the key, though, I would like my producer to use a key-based partitioning strategy, and so I'm going to assign that key to be cart1234. And the reason that I'm doing that is so that, if you can imagine what I might be doing with this data later on, is understanding at a user level what they're doing with their carts, right? And so ideally, I would have all of the cart updates living on the same partition for a, for a single cart, OK? So by using the default partitioning strategy and assigning a key, I'm ensuring that that will happen. I'm also not going to include any additional headers. OK, so now I can take a producer client, which in Kafka could be written in pretty much any language you want to, and take that information and write it into Kafka. Right? That's it. That's the, we're done now. Um, no, actually, <laughs> there's, there's some more we need to think about. Um, brokers only speak in bytes. They don't care about your nice little event in your human-readable format. They don't care about the object that you built up with all that information in it. No, they only speak in bytes, and so we need to serialize whatever object that we have into bytes for that broker to store. Okay? Um, so to do that, we are just uh, configuring our producer with a serialization format. Um, Avro, JSON, Protobuf, um, Parquet is being worked on. So these are all common formats that you can use with Kafka. Um, so all we need to do, like I said, is configure that producing client to have the right serializer. Um, and then we can use the corresponding deserializer on the consuming end uh, to read those bytes out. OK. Ultimately, what that means, if you are a sane person, is that you're probably going to use a schema. 
Everybody nod. We're going to use schemas. Yes. Okay. Please promise me that. That's the second thing you need to take away from this: is that please just use a schema. Um, so I could go on and on and on about why they're great and why you should do this. Um, but here is a pretty basic schema, um, an Avro schema that describes. Uh, exactly the data that we were talking about for these cart updates. So I have the cart ID, the particular action of adding, removing, or updating quantities, um, the particular uh, brick, you know, the element ID that we're dealing with, the description, and the quantity. Okay. Um, you might be asking yourself, you know, it's one thing entirely to know what your data looks like, and another thing to enforce that. We will get to that later on. Okay. So now. What is our producer doing? Well, our producer, we have it configured with the right serializer. We have our nice little object uh, describing the cart action of adding this particular element to the cart. And so now we can write that to our Kafka topic. But I want to let you know on a, um, just a little behind the scenes of what else the producer is doing for you every time you try to write data into Kafka. Um, they're first going to take that object, serialize it according to your serializer. So, um, then they're going to take, um, either they're going to use the partition that you've assigned with that message, or they are going to use their default partitioning strategy to compute the partition that that data is going to go to. Then, to be a little more efficient, they are going to batch some records together. If there are a number of events from that producer that are destined for the same broker or the same partition, um, the producer is going to be a little more efficient and group them together and send them as part of the same request. Okay. Yes, that might add a little more latency, but it also might be uh, better for latency. Um, then, optionally, it might compress that data. And then, finally, it's going to actually send it off to the broker. Okay? And so now, cool, that event uh, is on our Kafka topic, and we've appended it to the end of whatever partition it's on. Now, storing data is only half of it. Right? It gets a little more interesting when we read data out of Kafka. Right? We've got consumers. Right? So. What happens with consumers? So we have our cart updates topic that our, producers, our producer has been writing to with, with these cart updates. And suppose now that we have a consuming application that's coming up. And like I said, our goal is to kind of understand um, overall what are, the, what are the trends, what are these users doing with their carts. Maybe this consumer is building a model. Uh, predictive model uh, so that we can send, I don't know, coupons to people for things they're adding to their cart. Who knows? The world is your oyster. But we have this consuming application that wants to come up and read the data from the Kafka topic. When that consumer first comes online, it's never read from this Kafka topic before. Okay? It's brand new. It needs to know where to start. All right? So when new consumers are spun up, they have two options when they're starting from scratch. Uh, they can either read from the most recent part of the topic, or they can read from the beginning of the topic. Options. Okay. Um, for this particular consumer to uh, see uh, the largest amount of data so that we can build up a more um, a, a broader model, um, I'd like to start from the earliest part of the topic as possible. So we are going to start from the beginning. Um, so the first event that that consumer reads is going to be event with offset one. It will process that event, implement whatever business logic it has within it, um, and then it's going to process the next record. These are your consumers. It's pretty basic. Um, then you add a bunch more, and it gets more complicated. But pretty basic for here. Every so often, though, a consumer is going to do a little bit of bookkeeping, and they are going to tell Kafka what is the last message that it has fully processed. Where did it leave off on? Okay. Um, and so it's going to, like I said, send this offset to Kafka, and it's going to be stored in a Kafka topic there, um, so it can be durably stored. Again, so if the consumer goes down at any point in time, when it comes back up, it knows where it's left off. OK? So cool. At the same time, while the consumer is doing whatever it's doing, the producer can also keep writing data to the Kafka topic. It doesn't matter. They're completely decoupled. They will never care about each other. They never need to. It's beautiful. OK? Um, and it can keep going. We are not bound by any of the limitations or limited by you know, how long this consumer is taking to you know, implement its business logic. Um, and yeah, so the consumer can keep going. It'll commit its offsets um, off on its own. And oh, well, that sucks. Our consumer is dead. Inevitably, something's going to happen to that application. <laughs> maybe a machine rolls. Uh, maybe it hits some unrecoverable exception. I don't know. But in this case, that's unfortunate. Our consumer went down. Producers, producer doesn't care. <laughs> it's going to keep going, right? Um, again, the producers and consumers, they're completely independent of one another. Um, a consuming application dying is not going to affect the front of your pipeline, OK? Um, but eventually, maybe that consumer comes back online. And don't worry, 
we can keep going because it had its consuming offsets stored back on Kafka, so it could read that offset again and pick back up where it left off. All right. Now, the way that we saw that those, um, you know, we can take that, how that consumer is reading from that Kafka topic, and we can expand it to any number of consumers that we'd like to have, um, and they can all implement whatever logic they want to implement on top of that data, okay? And so all of these consumers, you can imagine they're from completely different use cases. They're completely decoupled from one another. Not only are the consumers uh, decoupled from the producers, they're also decoupled from one another, generally, okay? But what if we wanted our consumers to be, de uh, be coupled? Sometimes you want that, right? And so the reason you want to do that is so that we can parallelize the processing of the data from a single Kafka topic. So this Kafka topic, as you can see, has three partitions. And so our level of parallelism is capped at three. So how do we get to uh, you know, peak parallelism for this topic? Well, we start with one consumer, right? Maybe this is, uh, you know, we're building up that model um, to understand uh, user behavior on their carts. And so when we bring up that consumer, cool. It's going to read from all three partitions. Yeah? Maybe that's good enough. Maybe eventually, when we get to a certain point, um, we have too much data and it's not actually good enough, so we bring up another consumer. When that consumer is brought online, we are going to balance and redistribute these partitions to the number of consumers uh, that are in this consumer group. So the way that you define a consumer group is that when you bring up these consumers, you just define a string that says consumer group um, so that all of these consumers have the same uh, group uh, ID. Um, so when they come online, they're going to group. Okay. And again, we can keep going. We can add a third consumer. And at this point, we've reached peak parallelism, right? We have three consuming applications in the group. We have three partitions. Each consumer is going to get one partition to consume from. Cool. That's great. Doesn't get better than that. But what if we wanted to add a fourth one? This is completely, this is common practice. Uh, we can add a fourth or fifth or sixth consumer to this consumer group. It's kind of an opportunistic consumer. Um, it's literally just waiting for another one of them to die. So we call it a, a, a starved consumer. That consumer is not getting any partitions assigned to it for now. Um, but if one of those other consumers goes down, it's ready to go, right? So it's kind of a good thing. All right, consumer groups, great. Um, this is kind of dense to start off with. Um, it's going to get worse, but we're going to take a break. Um, so at this point, you understand sort of the b very basic building blocks of Kafka as a technology. Uh, it's a distributed event streaming platform. We use producers to write events as records and messages into Kafka topics where they're stored in individual partitions on specific nodes in that broker, in that cluster. Uh, for added reassurance, we're going to replicate that data across other nodes in the cluster. At any given time, we can have any number of consumers you know, coming along to read from any number of topics in that cluster um, and process those events for potentially different use cases without impacting one another or impacting one another. That's fine uh, in a consumer group. Um, so those consumers can work together in a consumer group to parallelize the processing for a single application. And remember that parallelism is capped at the number of partitions for that topic. So in a nutshell, that's Kafka. Plain. Vanilla Kafka. And I feel like saying something is vanilla has kind of like a negative connotation to it. So I want to nip that in the bud. Like, there's a lot that you can do with just Kafka. Okay? Um, you can build out a data mesh. You can build out a full microservices architecture with Kafka at the core. And that's a lot. That's pretty powerful for just, you know, just using regular Kafka. Okay? Now, it gets better than that. So you can take all of the power that you can get out of just Kafka and imagine what else you can do with a little bit more. Okay, so we're going to look uh, a little more broadly at the rest of the ecosystem because no technology exists in a vacuum, and Kafka is no exception. So let's take a step back and see what else we can do to um, make our real-time use cases that much more sophisticated. Okay, so I'm going to go back to sort of an example from earlier um, where we have our producer. It has an object according to a schema that we've written because we're good people. We wrote a schema. And it's going to write that data, uh, you know, serialize it according to that schema, and write that data into the Kafka topic. Cool. Now, what happens when our consumer comes along and wants to read that data from the topic? How does the consumer actually know what those raw bytes are supposed to look like? Okay. Well, if the consumer is lucky, we also have a copy of that schema on the consumer. Yeah. That would be great. That's ideal. And they can use that to re, you know, reconstruct and deserialize those bytes into the object that it should be. But then we kind of get a problem here, right? Because the benefit of Kafka is that the consumers and producers are completely decoupled. 
right? The producers throw things in, the consumers get things out, beautiful. But by adding this extra step of me having to copy the schema over or make it available to that consumer, oh no, <laughs> I've added, you know, I am, a, I am but a human, I'm going to make a mistake in copying that, that, uh, that schema over, or God forbid I actually forget to do it. Um, so that's not good, we're actually adding, you know, an extra bit of coupling in there to make this schema available to our consumer, okay? So that's where schema registry comes in. All right. Um, so there's a couple different implementations of schema registry, but they all generally follow the same constructs. Um, it lives outside of Kafka, uh, to sort of serve as middleman, um, you know, storing its sch the schemas before your cluster and its related metadata. Um, it allows for different schema compatibility levels so that you can handle um, how to upgrade your schemas and your clients. Um, and it helps, like I said, to sort of maintain that decoupling between the producers and consumers, okay? So um, that each of them can read those schemas without necessarily talking to one another, okay? So how does it work? Well, the producers um, are going to maintain, first and foremost, they are schema registry enabled, both of these clients. Um, the producer is going to maintain a cache of schemas that it's seen, right? So when it is writing data with a schema into schema registry, it's first going to check and see if that schema is in its cache. If it's not, it's going to register that schema with schema registry. Cool, and update its own cache. All right, um, only once um, the schema registry is registered can the producer use it to uh, de uh, serialize that object and write it into Kafka. When it actually goes through this serialization process, um, it is also going to append a magic byte at the front of that series of raw bytes along with the schema ID that, uh, that we're using for that version, okay? So that's in the Kafka topic, great. The consumer, who is also schema registry enabled, will maintain a cache of copies of schemas that it has seen, right? Um, so when it gets that data out of the Kafka topic, it sees that magic byte, and it's able to, it knows that it can extract that schema version ID um, from this series of raw bytes, and it's going to use that to fetch the right schema if it needs to fetch it or get it from its cache, and then it can deserialize the data, okay? Some extra steps in there, but you can see how now I don't have to update anything. Right? The consumer is able to, the producer is able to add new schemas when it needs to, if that uh, adheres to our compatibility levels, and the consumer can fetch that automatically in the way that they need to, okay? So now that we can ensure the quality and format of our data, things can start to get a little more interesting in our Kafka-based systems. Um, the next thing you might want to do with your applications is, as they evolve and they mature is um, connect Kafka with other data systems, right? Very rarely are you just um, you know, starting with a greenfield element with Kafka. Uh, normally, there is going to be some other systems that you have to connect with, and that's a job with, for Kafka Connect. Okay, pretty, pretty good name there. Um, so Kafka Connect is a way to connect Kafka with external data systems and treat them as data sources and data sinks. Um, when you run Kafka Connect, you point to your data sources. You can periodically and programmatically uh, pull the data, translate it into events, and write it into Kafka topics. Um, and on the sync side of things, you're able to move your events from Kafka to some downstream systems. Okay? Um, the cool thing about Kafka Connect is that it's a framework for doing this, right? Other people have already defined connectors, and so all you have to do is configure them and start running them. Okay? Um, there are hundreds of connectors out there, um, so I guarantee your use case is there. Um, if it's not, writing a connector isn't actually that hard. I've done it, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's not that hard. You can do it, okay? Um, so once you have a connector to run, um, it's low to no code, right? You are pr uh, providing to a configuration on how to connect with that data source or sync, um, and then connect is going to take it from there and move your data between Kafka and those systems. Okay, how does it do this? Well, with producers and consumers, with exactly uh, the, the fundamental building blocks that you just learned about. Um, so source connectors use producers after they take the data from the databases and move it into Kafka, and uh, we use consumers on the sync side of things to consume the data from Kafka and move it out into your external sinks. All right. now, the very more, much more interesting thing that you would do with Kafka is start to actually process your data, right? Um, so this can be done within Kafka itself, but also with other technologies in the ecosystem. So stream processing within Kafka, let's look at that first. Um, so at the basic level, you can use producers and consumers to do stream processing, right? You set up consumers to read data from your Kafka topics, you implement whatever business logic you want, and then you set up producers to write the results back into another Kafka topic. Cool. 
If you're doing stateless processing, that's very, very simple and very straightforward. When you add state into the mix, it gets a little more complicated, um, especially when you consider what do you do when um, you need to fail over, if you have multiple consuming applications, multiple instances. Um, completely doable, but it gets a little hairy. So you're going to use one of the next uh, two options. Uh, moving up in complexity is uh, Kafka Streams. Um, so Kafka Streams is a Java um, and Scala library that takes this, uh, this hassle of managing state uh, off of your hands for, uh, for stream processing in Kafka. Um, so it allows you to define a topology on how you want to actually process your data. Um, and then you can spin up multiple instances of your Kafka Streams applications. Um, and it's, it's built on top of the consumer and producer API. So it's going to allow you to uh, achieve that parallelism of processing, um, having multiple instances consume from the uh, different partitions of the input topics and scale accordingly. Okay? Um, any state that you have in your stateful Kafka Streams applications uh, is stored locally, but then also committed back up to Kafka. All right? So what this means is that if you do have an instance where you need to fail over, one instance goes down, and we need to fail over that uh, partition to another running instance, uh, we don't have to start from scratch. It can consume that state back from Kafka and use that to initialize um, and restart. Um, and then moving up in ease of use, we have KSQL DB, which is a SQL wrapper on top of Kafka Streams. Um, so it just makes it a little more accessible to do your processing. All right. But it's not just in Kafka, right? There's a pretty rich ecosystem of stream processing tools that all integrate very, very well with Kafka. Um, there's a lot of talks at this conference um, on, on Flink and more on Kafka if you want to see how to uh, use some of these technologies, and I would encourage you to. But I see a lot of people you know, trying to decide you know, which technologies to actually use, which ones do I assess, which one's best for my use case. No one can give you the one blanket answer on which stream processing technology uh, is going to be best for you. And so I encourage you to check them all out, right? Um, the benefit is, or the great thing is, that if you're storing your data in Kafka, you can have any number of POCs from different technologies consuming the same data, um, and you could be assessing those in parallel, right, to see which technology is actually best for your particular use case. All right. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to check out as many of these as you possibly can. Um, and again, check out some of the talks that we have going on here today. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of inspiration before you move on, because I've given you the LEGO pieces, and now you want to see what sets you can build, right? because we're in the Lego store. Um, first up, financial services. Um, I think one of the most compelling use cases for real-time um, real data is financial services. Um, so I've seen a lot of really, really, use case, really cool use cases from banks and other financial institutions where Kafka is at the core of their real-time market data and how they're processing and assessing that information. Um, IoT and manufacturing. Um, these are huge um, sort of up-and-coming use cases where Kafka is playing a key role. So um, typically, if you've, worked, if you've worked in manufacturing or understand some of these use cases, um, every manufacturing line has hundreds, dozens of sensors on it. Um, and usually, the, you know, those sensors are very providing a lot of rich information about the particular uh, state of this machine at any given time. But a lot of that information stays within the factory. Okay? Um, so I've seen um, a lot of companies, I know, extracting all this information, pushing it into Kafka so that they can do, um, have more up to the second, uh, up to the millisecond granularity of their lines um, and be able to um, you know, distill more insights from that. Um, and then inventory systems. Um, so an entire catalog for a business, um, its inventory could be kept up to date, be kept in Kafka at all given times. Um, this might not sound that exciting, but this could actually be like a, um, just a small component of a larger sort of microservices architecture where your orders, your shipments, your inventory updates are all uh, flowing through Kafka um, and driven by events. All right, so I can keep going on and on and on, um, and I will be here all day if you want to talk more about Kafka and interesting use cases. Um, but yeah, I hope that this isn't the last time that you think about Kafka, if it was, if it was the first time. Um, so I encourage you to play around with it, um, see what else you can build with it. Uh, here's a link to my link tree. Um, on there, I have a number of interesting resources, things that I find cool, things that I'm working on. Um, but I also have a link on there to uh, Confluent Developer, which is our developer portal. Um, so if you are interested in seeing how to actually meaningfully get started with these technologies, we have a ton of tutorials and a number of free courses on there um, to reiterate some of the introductory things that you learned about today um, and take it uh, more, you know, take you that much further into Kafka as well. So check it out. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions here, but I will be around. So thank you.
I think we can do a couple of questions. Okay. Hi. First of all, thank you. It was yep. very useful. So I was wondering, uh, um, so usually when you have, a, for example, a consumer and say that, you know, uh, your consuming application is doing some uh, processing with these messages and, you know, I can say that I read everything until uh, like message three, but maybe one of them failed the processing. But at the same time, for example, I want to retry one, but two and three are fine. So I was wondering what would be the um, normal way of solving this problem? Are there any common patterns for you know, handling retries and failures of this kind? Yeah, um, so that's on you <laughs> in your application to, to actually implement that. But generally, um, you know, those, once, when you pull those messages from Kafka, um, they're kind of cached on the consumer to then uh, pull them sort of in order, okay? So you're going to be processing one, two, three, four, et cetera, in order. Um, if you fail on one, you're not going to move on. Okay, so you're not going to hit that case where um, we're going to go on and try to process two if one didn't actually succeed, like if we, if we crashed and burned there. Um, so you would then you know, catch whatever sort of uh, you know, exception in there and retry um, before you move on to two and three. Okay. And then we're not going to commit, we're not going to tell Kafka that you reached a certain point or a certain watermark until that full you know, batch of records made it through. Okay, yeah. so it, there is no automated way of uh, handling this in uh, with the normal Kafka APIs. It's, uh, it's just on the consumer. Uh, no, the, the basic API provides that batch of records to you and then you will implement any sort of retries on your end. Yeah, yeah. makes sense, thank you. Hi, thanks for the, for the intro. It all sounds uh, very nice, and my question is, what are the, the caveats or the issues that users usually encounter so that we can be aware of it when thinking about using Kafka? Just, it's just too gosh darn easy. Um, no, so seriously, like the, one of the biggest hurdles or class of hurdles that I see people encountering is that it's a black box. Right, and, and in that, you know, me saying that it is too easy is kind of leading into that, right? Um, you throw data in, you hope that it gets where it needs to go, and then you hope that you can get it back out later on. And occasionally, it doesn't work as expected. And that's the most frustrating class of errors because if you are not the operator of your cluster, in most cases, the people who are using it are not the people operating it, um, that's just that much more frustrating. Um, so I think that um, is kind of going into Kafka with the mindset of like, Ah, it's a black box, of course, it's going to work, it's going to be fine, right? And then not understanding where to actually look when you do hit an issue. None of those issues are unsolvable, um, but I've seen them really stop people, um, you know, in their tracks and they kind of give up, <laughs> you know, like the data wasn't, or I'm getting like duplicate events, or I don't understand how to configure that producer right to make sure that we're not hitting issues when the data is stored, or I'm losing data, why am I losing data? And well, you know, we can ensure that doesn't, doesn't happen, but there's other hurdles that you're, and other configurations that you need to be using to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's both too simple and too complex. And so sometimes just the expect, managing expectations of people going into it, I think is sort of the bigger, bigger problem. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has one last quick question, we can go. Otherwise, yeah. No, you all have to stay. <laughs> you mentioned uh, the option of field where you add a timestamp. So if you publish a timestamp in, like, let's say, the reverse order, would the um, queue still maintain the order in which it's published in or the timestamp order? Yeah, so that's going to be, a, be affected on the consuming side of things or when you actually want to process because that's where it actually matters, right? Um, and so you would either look at when was this... So the short answer is that data is going to be appended when it was appended to the log. That's, there's going to be a timestamp of when that event was actually written to the Kafka topic. Okay? Um, and so your timestamps are going to be kind of uh, out of sync at that point, right? Because you have a, you have a timestamp that you manually assign to that message, but it's not the same as the timestamp at which it was appended, right? Um, and maybe that doesn't matter. 
Maybe it does matter. You have to decide on your stream processing side of things, um, you know, which timestamp you want to use and how um, knowing that that could be effectively out of sync. So you have options down the line on how you actually resolve that. But there are di at that point, there are different timestamps. Um, you know, there's one associated with the message, and there's one associated with it's being written to the log. Yeah. That's one of the other complexities. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much for your presentation. Absolutely. Thank you all.